So I think we're all set to begin with presentations. Uh, go ahead, Chris, with the sky this month. Thanks, Paul, and hello, everybody. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, beautiful Thornhill, Ontario, which is actually within the city of Markham. So Paul and I are neighbors in a sense. And I'm just outside the Toronto city limits. So you'll see that a number of my uh, my Stellarium, when I demo it, is uh, based in Thornhill. But for all intents and purposes, it's Toronto. So don't, don't be alarmed. You'll, you'll see the same thing that I see up here in Thornhill, north of Steeles. All right, so I'm going to cover the sky this month for the period of June 2nd to July 7th. So it's about five weeks. And this block of time is that fortunate good news, bad news scenario. We've got more and more clear skies, but we're also bracketing the summer June solstice, which means that we have those late, late uh, sunsets and those short periods of darkness. So let's let's head on. Before I get into the observing part, let's, let's cover a little bit on space exploration and a few of the launches that you can look out for. Now, I've uh, I prepared a set of notes for this talk that I'll upload to rescto.ca uh, with a PDF, which has got more details. But uh, for now, let's look at a couple of the launches um, that I picked on the list. So tomorrow at around 1, 1 30 p.m., we've got the Falcon 9 rocket launching from Kennedy Space Center with the Dragon 2 spacecraft on a cargo mode. So no, no humans on board, just cargo. But those launches are great opportunities to get out your binoculars and look up your, um, your space station passes and see if you can see the, the cargo ship chasing the ISS across the sky. So that's a, that's a fun one. On June 10th, we've got China launching astronauts into space. So they recently launched their Tianhe-1 space station. And on the 10th of June, they're going to send multiple astronauts to rendezvous and dock with it. Um, I'm not sure how long they're staying, if, uh, if they are staying, but uh, anyway, that's, that's to keep an eye on. And this is, by the way, this picture in the background is the Chinese space station uh, mock-up. And then at mid-month on the 15th, we have the U.S. Air Force and Northrop Grumman launching a classified spy satellite cargo. So I, I always like to mention those. And then sometime later, uh, later in June or perhaps early July, we have a Soyuz rocket lifting off from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with another delivery to the to the ISS. Whoops. And that one again is something you could keep an eye out for. Um, basically, you know, within a day or so after launch, uh, if you get an ISS pass, an International Space Station pass, watch for that uh, little uh, cargo ship chasing across the sky. So let's get into some observing. Uh, if you want to act and contribute to citizen science and help us map light pollution, you can participate in the Globe at Night program. And in 2021, uh, during the period I'm discussing tonight, we actually have two uh, dark moonless periods. So we're into one right now. And these two moonless periods I've got circled here. And the focus there is to uh, head outside wherever you are and observe the constellation of Hercules and report back to Globe at Night uh, how many of the stars you can make out in the constellation. And if you visit uh, globeatnight.org, you can um, print out the sky charts that they provide you with comparative um, sky charts for the different um, amounts of light pollution. So you can see which one matches your sky the best. In terms of sunrises and sunsets, as I alluded to, uh, right now we've got the sun rising at 538 in the morning and setting about 9 p.m., which gives us 15 and a quarter hours of daylight. Uh, five weeks from now in our early July meeting, that'll be um, increased a little bit by two minutes to 15 and 15 hours and 17 minutes because we've gone past the peak uh, longest day and we're now we'll be heading down into the uh, day shortening again after the third week of, um, of June. So here we are uh, speaking of that on the 20th of June at 1130 in the morning uh, summer officially begins at the June solstice. That's the point in the year when the sun is its farthest distance uh, north of the celestial equator. And then just for fun, we've got Earth. Earth's orbit is elliptical, of course. So on July 5th at 6 p.m., Earth will officially be at its farthest point uh, from the sun in our orbit, or about 1.5 million kilometers. Now, in terms of uh, seeing objects uh, at night when it's dark, you want the sky to be as dark as you can get it. And what we need to do there is to wait for the sun to drop below the horizon sufficiently so that the sky gets darker, uh, as dark as it can be. 
So this is a, this graphic just shows you the examples of how low the sun needs to be below the horizon for different classes of twilight. An astronomical twilight is the one we want to be finished with in order to get our full night of darkness. An astronomical twilight ends when the sun is dropped lower than 18 degrees below the horizon. And then astronomical twilight will resume in the morning when the sun climbs to within 18 degrees from the eastern pre-dawn sky, eastern pre-dawn horizon. And for um, the period that I'm covering tonight, the astronomical twilight tonight will end at 11.10 p.m. and resume at 3.21 a.m., giving imagers who want that dark, dark sky about four hours and 11 minutes of imaging. And that drops by about two minutes um, at, the, at the next uh, RAND meeting on July 7th. Uh, in terms of observing the moon, we've got apogees and perigees, of course, as the moon gets closer and farther. This is significant because the full moon that we had last week was a so-called supermoon, which is what we call a moon, not astronomers, but the media and so on, uh, refer to when the moon is within 90% of its closest approach to the Earth in its elliptical orbit. And that would have been, that would have been the largest full moon of 2021. Uh, two weeks after that, we get the um, uh, apogee moon around the 7th of June or so. And that apogee, will be when the moon is smallest, basically farthest from the Earth and a little smaller in the sky, that's going to be followed a few days later by a solar eclipse. And because the moon is just past apogee during that solar eclipse, it'll produce an annular eclipse where the moon isn't sufficiently large to cover the whole disk of the sun. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the circumstances of the eclipse here in a couple of minutes. In terms of the moon phases, we have third quarter moon uh, was this morning at 3.24 a.m., um, third quarter moons rise around midnight and set during the middle of the day. Then we have our new moon on Thursday the 10th in the morning. That will, that will bring that solar eclipse I just mentioned. The week after that, we get our first quarter moon. So the best time to view the moon in the sky, conveniently after dinner or after it's dark, is that, uh, that first quarter through full period on June 17th to the 24th. That 24th will bring us the full strawberry moon. For obvious reasons, it's the time of year when the strawberries are, are ready, to, ready to harvest. And then on July 1st, we have, uh, since we're doing five weeks of sky this month, we have time to fit another, another phase of the moon in. We get another third quarter repeating uh, on the 1st of July at the end of the month. And in terms of when you want to be looking at the dark sky, the deep sky objects, the dim objects, the best period to do that is the period between third quarter and new. So that's basically from right now, tonight, uh, around past the 10th, so you could squeak another few nights after the 10th as the full young crescent moon, uh, young crescent moon sets early, uh, soon after sunset. So leaving the sky nice and dark for a, a couple of nights after the new moon. And then that, that, that dark, dark moonless period will resume again as we get past the first and beyond July. Uh, if you're interested in getting, um, Observing the moon in your telescope and wanting a good resource to do that, I highly recommend this NASA's Dial a Moon page. And you can actually navigate to this website and dial in uh, your date and time in universal time. So you need to adjust the four hours uh, back to, uh, to Eastern time if you're using it. And it'll produce for you a, a current view of the moon at that hour. And that's a great tool for seeing what the phase of the moon is at the moment. It'll give you annotated version of it. It'll even give you a version that's flipped upside down for your, you know, if you're using a Newtonian reflector where the moon is inverted in your eyepiece. And I, li I like using this tool also for confirming lunar X predictions. So if you hear that the, oh, there's a lunar X uh, going to appear on the moon near first quarter, then you can tinker with the hours on this dial and, and, and see just exactly which hour it'll be at its maximum. So let's switch over and, and do a little looking at Stellarium. Here's the sky uh, tonight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up some uh, Stellarium bookmarks to highlight some of the things that I've got coming on. So while we've been stuck at home, I've been encouraging people to enjoy the moon as a, as a target. Um, one of the things that you're going to see first is, oops, get this on here. There we go. On around the 12th of June, you can keep an eye out for the young crescent moon between Venus and Mars and keep an eye out for Earth shine. That's that reflected sunlight. Uh, bouncing off the Earth and illuminating the majority of the Moon's darker dark disk. And you can get this, doesn't have to be just the 12th, you might be able to get it the evening before or an evening or two after that as well. 
So that's Earth shine. And then things to look out for in the moon, some of the major features to watch for uh, on the next few nights. By the time we get to around past first quarter, say until around the 18th, let's go back a day to the 18th, um, you can then look for the lunar straight wall, Rupus recta, or the straight wall on the moon. That's located below the moon's equator near uh, uh, Marinubium here. That's a nice little vertical uh, cliff that uh, is very highly enhanced uh, just after first quarter, a night or two after first quarter. And then if you head on up to the top, and these are these are probably visible on binoculars. If you've got good binoculars, maybe on a tripod, you can look for these cool uh, dramatic mountain ranges. So we've got the Apennine Mountains and the, the uh, Lunar Alps that are actually the former sort of rim of the big um, Marinubium, or Marimbrium impact basin crater as well. Let me just bring this to center again, advance a couple more nights. A couple of nights later, you can look for the so-called golden handle effect. It's the, the rim of a partially submerged crater, now, now known as the Sinus Iridum or the Bay of Rainbows. And the former rim of the crater, it gets illuminated by the sun from the east and produces a nice sort of curved, bright curve feature on the lunar surface and it's got uh, a couple of lunar promontories. Sinus Iridium is very, very flat, but if you grab your telescope and zoom in, you might be able to see some wrinkle ridges at this particular phase of the moon's uh, cycle. A couple of nights after that, you can start focusing in on some of the neat Western features on the moon. So for example, the uh, crater Copernicus. Copernicus is really good um, both when it's um, partially in shadow, but also when the moon is getting full because you can see the terraced edges that are inside the rim, the collapsed features on the inside of the rim. And you can look for these little dark halos. So some of the um, small craters around Copernicus have white centers and dark little rings around them because of the way the impact has come in and punched through the, um, uh, the ejecta from Copernicus and punched down into the darker bar Amari basalt underneath and spread that out in a little ring around the crater. So you get these dark haloed craters around Copernicus. And one of the neat things that I like looking at is the Rider Gamma Swirl. So that's, that's down here. This is Aristarchus and Kepler. And if you make a little triangle and down to their sort of lower left, onto the west, you can see this weird patch, sort of a stain, like a bright stain on the moon. And uh, scientists think that, that that's maybe as a result of a, a strong localized magnetic field that's prevented the, the rest of the lunar Mari from darkening, so protecting it from cosmic rays. So you can see this cool... Uh, sort of a tadpole shape on the moon. So those are a few things that you can look at during that moon observing period that I talked about a little while ago. All right, so let's jump up and talk a little bit about planets. So I'm gonna go back to now, and I'm just gonna bring up the Western sky. So the, you know, the planets that we have in the evening right now have mainly been Mars for quite some time. Mars has been sort of parked halfway up the western sky for um, a number of months, actually. Uh, but in, in fact, the Earth and Mars are actually increasing their distance from each other. So Mars has actually been getting smaller and dimmer uh, week after week after week. But it's been parked there because as the sky gets carried uh, west by the motion of the Earth around the sun, Mars's orbital motion eastward is counteracting some of that. And so it's sort of been holding its own as it swims kind of upstream. But that's coming to an end. So during the, the next few weeks, you're going you're gonna to see Mars losing its, uh, losing its grip and starting to sink uh, into the setting sun. And as it does that, we've got bright Venus that's starting a long, um, quite a lengthy apparition in the western post-sunset sky for us for, I think, most of this year uh, coming up to join it. They'll actually have a really close meeting uh, in about the middle of July. What I can do now is, before we get there, though, I'm just going to bring the time a little bit later and show you a cool event that's going to happen with Mars right around the 23rd of June. Mars is going to actually cross right through the Beehive Cluster, Messier 44. So if you want to make a note of that, uh, that they'll be, you know, they'll be telescope close for about three nights with the 23rd being the so sort of the one where it goes right through. If I continue to advance the time, you see that actually Venus is going to do the same thing. It's going to pass through the, the beehive as well. But by then, K2 
cancer will be so low in the West that it'll be virtually impossible to see those stars from our latitude. Uh, and then, as I said, if we advance another couple of weeks, and I'm sure the next person to do the sky this month will talk about this close Venus and Mars conjunction uh, on the 12th of July. All right, let's wind back. And talk about a couple of other things. So the other thing we've got going on is that the big gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are now on the verge of starting to join the evening sky. So they're going to be starting to rise around midnight within the next couple of weeks, and you'll be able to catch them uh, sitting in the southeastern sky uh, between, you know, basically between about 1 a.m. and an almost sunrise because they're bright enough to, to last into view um, as the sky is brightening in the morning. Um, one of the cool things that you can look for is on the 26th of June, we're going to get a cool double shadow transit on Jupiter where two of Jupiter's four Galilean moons will be aligned in such a way that their shadows will, will land on the planet as they orbit Jupiter. And what I, what I think is really interesting about this event is that because Io's, Io has a smaller shadow because it's a smaller moon and it's closer to the planet. And then we have Callisto, which is farther from Jupiter, has a bit of a larger shadow. But Io being closer to Jupiter actually orbits around the planet faster. And so if you get up and look at this event, it starts about a little bit after 1 a.m. on the 26th. But if I advance the time, you can see that because Io orbits Jupiter faster, its shadow will overtake Callisto's shadow. And right around 2, say 2.20, 2.25 a.m., it'll, they'll, they'll sort of pass each other, and then Io will lead the way across the planet uh, for the rest of the time. So that's going to happen for us in the greater Toronto area. That's going, that event will happen in a dark sky. It's just it's in the wee hours if you're interested in getting up at that time of the day. Uh, another neat thing with um, with Mars, with um, the Jupiter and Saturn, is that on the, if I get this to come up, is that on the 28th of June, we've got a nice photo opportunity of the moon sitting between Jupiter and Saturn in the morning sky. Those will, you know, they'll stay in view by the time it starts to get light in the morning, around 5 a.m., let's say. Um, they'll be shining over the southern horizon. So that may be something you want to get up and, and take a look at. Now, talking about that apogee moon, that brings us to the solar eclipse. Let me just bring the solar eclipse into view here. So that's an annual solar eclipse. For the Toronto area, the eclipse will be underway when the sun rises at about, uh, let's see, around 5, 540 in the morning. And so you can see that the moon will be covering about 80% of the sun. Um, worth getting up. I mean, if you've got a low, if it's a clear morning, you set, check the forecast before setting your alarm, of course. Uh, head up. You need to find a location that's got a nice, wide open, you know, east, northeastern horizon. And it's not going to be one that's, uh, you know, going to be as easy to photograph because it's so low and so on. But uh, definitely you can get up and take a look. This eclipse will be visible in the partial phase across um, a large areas of eastern Canada. So if you live even further east of T Toronto, sort of in the, you know, Quebec, Montreal, Maritimes area, you'll get perhaps a little better view of it. Um, and it's over for us in the Toronto area by about 640 in the morning. That's when the fourth contact will happen. The moon will finally move off the sun altogether. Obviously, um, this eclipse, no part of this eclipse will be safe to view without proper solar filters. Um, there have been solar filters available from U of T has been providing them. Um, the Sky News uh, has skynews.ca, Canada's mag astronomy magazine, had them for order on their store. Uh, you may be able to go to Mastermind or something like that in order to get a pair by the 10th of June. Obviously, you want to keep those Eclipse viewers once you've got them for the big show on April 8th of 2024, when we get a nice, uh, almost full solar eclipse from Toronto and, and complete totality from in parts of Buffalo and, and Trenton, places like that. And that at that time, the sun will be nice and high in the sky at the peak of that eclipse. So mark your calendars. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that. Uh, a couple of other cool things to look out for this month. Minor planets. 
So the, uh, the main belt asteroid Vesta has been uh, hanging around in Leo for a little while now. And what's going to happen is around the, say, the 9th to the 12th of June, it's going to cross past the Leo triplet of galaxies. You can see them here in this view. So that's about 20 arc seconds between the, the, um, the pair M, let me just get the labels on here. M66 and M65 and the asteroid. Vesta's magnitude 7.35, so if it's a dark night, you can certainly see it in binoculars. Um, but if you've got uh, your telescope out and you want to catch uh, a view of the asteroid passing them, that would be great. Or even, um, you know, a, a composite photo of a of Vesta over a few nights would be a cool thing to see. I'm sure some rascal somewhere will get some pictures like that. Uh, another one a bit similar to that is Juno. So Juno is going to reach opposition. Let me just get my note here and let you know when. So on the 6th of June, Juno will be at opposition and it's sitting inside the box of Ophiuchus. That's in the Southern sky, Southeastern sky. Uh, but this is the sky at about 10 PM once it gets fully dark here. And then over the next few nights, it's eventually, and this is a little dimmer. So it's magnitude 10.1. Uh, so it's not as bright, but, uh, on the 13th, you can catch this naked eye star, 30 Ophiuchi. But the real fun happens around the 18th, 17th, 18th, when Juno is going to have a close encounter with Messier 10, the globular cluster Messier 10. So that'll be another, uh, another uh, uh, example of that mix of, of, of solar system object and deep sky object uh, uh, meeting up. So that's a neat effect. Uh, now, comets. So we've got a, one comet that I noted worth looking at, and that's comet C2020 T2 Palomar. And uh, as of tonight, it's sitting in Western Botes, 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 but roughly between midway between Arcturus and uh, Beta Comae, Beta Coma Berenices. And over the next five weeks, this is the track from tonight down to July 7th. So it's going to be dropping southward between the, those two constellations. Um, notice, note that Stellarium reports a much fainter magnitude than observers have been reporting. So most observers have been reporting this comet at about magnitude 10 and a half, uh, which is certainly within the range of, of telescopes that uh, most of us have. And, uh, and so it'd be worth, uh, worth checking that out. Um, the it's about peaking in brightness now, so it'll gradually fade in, in brightness over the next uh, few weeks, but you know, certainly during this nice moonless period we're in right now would be a great opportunity to go and check out uh, that, that comet. Uh, let's switch over and talk a little bit about viewing satellites. Just bring up this. So right now the International Space Station is flying over Toronto. Um, it's until tomorrow night. So, so the past that's been happening in evening will come to an end tomorrow night. Um, and then it'll start appearing in the pre-dawn on the 27th and beyond. And I've noted here a few of the bright ones that are in the wee hours that I won't be getting up for, but maybe you want to get up there. Some of them are quite bright. Um, and if you're interested in seeing that Chinese space station, I noted that um, you can find it using the heavensabove.com website. So that's heavens-above.com. Once you're there, you need to use the box in the upper right corner to install or in, insert, or find uh, your location, your geographic location. And then it'll report to you the sightings of these various bright satellites. So the Chinese space station has its own entry in heavensabove.com now. And I noted that it'll resume some pre-dawn passes on the 18th of June. And some of these passes are, are as bright as magnitude 1.1. So it's not as bright as the space station, but um, it certainly um, would be very noticeable as across the sky. And um, in terms of uh, asteroidal occultations, I noted that we've got one occurring on the 18th of June at uh, one minute to midnight. And it's, uh, it's asteroid Mentor, which is a really dim asteroid, uh, occulting the star with a dip of 1.79 magnitudes for nine seconds. And where that's located is it's in, it's in, Aquila, I'll just bring up the view here and show you the occulted star. So it sits here in the upper wing of Aquila 
in the southeastern sky around midnight on the on the 18th, 19th. So that's an asteroidal occultation you can keep an eye out for. Now, in terms of what to look at in terms of the deep sky, um, first of all, variable stars. If you're interested in variable stars, there's a couple of them that are quite accessible to beginners. Let me just bring up this one here. I'll just bring my notes back up. Bring with me a second. Here we go. So Almazan, this is this is uh, Aquila again. We're still in Aquila. This star Almazan 2 or Eta Aquilae is a variable star. It's a Cepheid variable star that varies in brightness from magnitude three and a half to almost four and a half over 7.18 days. And at maximum, it shines almost as bright as the tail lambda. So when you're out looking at Aquila, see if you can see if the star is similar to lambda, or maybe it's more like one of these stars in between. This is a magnitude 4.4 star. This is a magnitude 3.4 star. So that's 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 Eta Aquilae. Another one that you can check out is Sheliac, which is in one of the corners of the parallelogram of, of Lyra. Sheliac uh, is actually uh, an eclipsing binary system. So it varies again between about magnitude 3.3 and 4.4 over about 13 days. And uh, at its peak, it shines as bright as the star Sulafat. So you can see instantly how it is compared to Sulafat. And at its dimmest, it's, it's as bright as Delta. So you can use these three of the four corners of Lyra to, to judge or gauge uh, what part of the cycle Sheliac is in. Now, in terms, of, uh, in terms of deep sky, what I recommend that people focus on this month is take a look and give some love to the constellation of Canis Venatici. It's not a very uh, glamorous co constellation. It's really only got these two uh, main stars. It's, uh, it's actually meant to be the hunting dogs. So Canis Venatici are the hunting dogs. Um, the bright star, Corcoroli, is actually a wonderful double star. Doesn't, you don't need uh, much skill to pick this one up or split it in your telescope. And it's part of the RASC double star observing program. So that's an easy one to mark off your, off your list. Another one of the stars in Canis Venatici that's a part of the double star program is a more challenging one, and that's 2CVN. And that's this one down here. And you can see you need a little more power to split this one to magnify enough to split it. I'm just going to add a, a, a telescope view here just to get a, there's about a one and a half degree eyepiece field of view circle. And uh, let's, let's look at some of the other neat things that are available in this constellation. So first of all, we've got Messier 3, which is a bright globular cluster. So that's a great one to check out. And we've got other Messier objects. We've got M106. Spiral galaxy, whoops, pulled it out of the view here. There's M106. We've got M94, more of a face on spiral, smaller, but, but a bright, uh, bright core to it. And then we've got Messi 63 up here. Well, not as quite as bright, but, uh, but uh, that's the sunflower galaxy. But then don't neglect the other corner because that's where we've got our friend Messi 51, the whirlpool galaxy. So a lot of people think of that as, or associate this galaxy with the Big Dipper, with the tip of the handle of the Big Dipper, the star Alcade, but actually it's inside the border of Canis Venatici. So those are the, those are the sort of uh, Messier targets, but there's all kinds of other great targets. So the RASC has a program or an, an alternate list to the Messier is called the Finest NGC program. And there are a number of Finest NGC galaxies in, in this constellation from that list. Uh, one of which is a famous one. Let's see if we can grab here. The, where's our whale? Here we go. So the whale and the hockey stick are, share the eyepiece of a low power telescope. These are quite bright galaxies. They're not large, but they're quite bright surface brightness because they're, they're edge on to us. Um, the whale is so-called because there's a small NGC tucked in beside it that sort of looks like the, the, uh, the, the breath coming out of the whale. It's got a bit of a whale shape as well. It's not a very symmetrical shaped uh, disc to that galaxy. And then the crowbar or hockey stick galaxy sit nearby. We've got some 
uh, gravitational tugging going on that has uh, that has distorted the shape of this galaxy. So uh, check those out. Uh, we've also got let's see the water bug galaxy here. Here's my water bug. This is the finest NGC galaxy. The finest NGCs don't tend to be quite as big and bright as the Messiers, but they're definitely worth a look. Uh, silver needle. Where's our silver needle? Just to give you another example of one here. So this is another. Uh, quite large in the eyepiece, but very narrow slash, and it, it's bright as a result of its edge on appearance. And, you know, hunt around. There are lots of other uh, really cool objects in this, in this constellation. We've got so a really lovely open spiral here, NGC 4395. And if you just grab your Stellarium and look around, um, you can pick up uh, a number of these that are bright enough to see. Uh, one tip that you can use in Stellarium actually is to go into the sky viewing options, head over to your deep sky objects tab, and switch on your use proportional hints. And that'll actually make the symbol a little bit bigger if the object is a little bit brighter and easier to see. So you can sort of rank the deep sky objects that way. Um, one of the things I want to also mention when you're using Stellarium for sort of planning your observing is to uh, not all objects have a picture associated with them. So here's an example of uh, a galaxy that I wrote about in Sky News, uh, the current Sky News issue of uh, the hiding in plain sight, where this is the star, here's the Big Dipper, and this is the rear leg of Ursa Major. And around the sort of knee or elbow of the rear, rear leg of the bear is the star uh, Chi, Ursa Majori. And there's an NGC sitting here, but there doesn't look like much going on. But if you go down to your Stellarium and you enable your Deep Sky Survey tab, it'll reveal that there's actually quite a bright little edge-on galaxy sitting there right beside the star. So you can use your telescope without a go-to, just aim it at the star. Um, bear in mind the, you know, the field of view is one and a half degrees, depending on the size of field of view of your telescope, maybe more, maybe less. And you can pick up uh, some of these objects that are just tucked in close to brighter objects. And uh, just to finish off, I just thought I'd mention La Superba. So La Superba is a cool carbon star in Canis Venatici. It's also known as uh, YCVN. And it pulsates and changes its magnitude between about 4.8 and 7.3 over half a year, 157 days. It's located, so here's the Big Dipper. And here's the stick of the hunting dogs and La Superbus, this nice reddish star tucked in there. And so I think with that, I'll stop and see if anyone has any questions. Chris, thank you so much for a very thorough The Sky this month, as always. Great job. Well done. Uh, let's go to Emma and find out if we have any questions online. Um, we do. First question comes in from Leo. Are there any good sites in the GTA to see the eclipse? So obviously for the eclipse, you don't need, what you need is a sight line. You don't need to be sort of, you know, escaping the city lights or anything like that. Um, anything that you can see, let me just grab the eclipse. Uh, bring that back up again here. So the key here is if you can get to high ground, you wanna be able to be as high as you can, high in elevation and have a view uh, towards the dawn, right? It's the dawn sky, the northeastern sky. So maybe the lake side, the lakeside might help you in some cases, although it's sort of in the wrong quadrant for Lake Ontario's shoreline. But uh, if you keep an eye on the uh, the Rascals forum and uh, messages like that, we'll be reporting various places to go. Assuming that, you know, it's safe to, uh, to travel, you want to maintain your social distancing and follow your, um, your local medical uh, advice about uh, you know gathering for eclipse watching and you can watch it online they'll be streaming it online as well thank you um Ennio wants to know is there a minimum aperture size to see the galaxies as well as vesta um it really comes down to how dark your sky is so if it's already moonless so if you can get yourself a dark sky location away from light pollution you can get down to Oh, a four inch telescope, four inch, six inch telescope would be more than enough to see the Leo triplet. They're fairly, um, they're fairly bright galaxies and Vesta itself would be no problem at all. 
Second question from Ennio. Are there any pictures shot by amateurs of the Chinese station? Hmm, I haven't seen any, but I'm sure I'm sure we'll be getting some. Uh, there'll be more attention, of course, once the uh, astronauts head up. So uh, stay tuned to the media for that. Do you know how the Chinese space station compares to the ISS in number of astronauts size and distance from Earth? Uh, I don't have all the details, but I, it's it's one of these processes where the station will is planned to be uh, grown in size by adding modules over time. Uh, if you Google uh, images of the station, you can see kind of the base module now, but you can see mock-ups, artist renditions, where it's got uh, lots of modules strapped onto it and a bigger network created. So I don't know what the time frame is for that, but um, I'm imagine that they plan to to grow it bigger if they can. Uh, last question comes in from Blake. Um, what is the compass bearing of the sunrise for the GTA? Ah, it's right here on the screen right now. So this will be 57 degrees, almost 58 degrees um, east of north, east of true north. That's all the questions. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, thanks again, Chris. Uh, I know it takes a long time to prepare such a presentation, so we really appreciate the time you put into it. Mm -hmm.